good morning friends sorry good evening it is almost time seven our speaker is ready and also we have almost 17 19 participants i hope we can uh, start today's bible study Reverend Paras, are you ready? Yes, Pastor. Okay. Shall we pray? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for keeping all of us safe and sound thus far. It's all because of your grace and love, Lord. We could see the beginning of this evening. Let this evening be a blessed one to each and every one of us. Especially we commit this Bible study, this session unto your keeping. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us for the past few weeks we ask you to bless us and speak to us continuously so that we can understand the scripture in a better way and we can continue to live as a practicing christians lord help us to have all grace and mercy upon us so that in the days to come we can continue to shine for your glory we commit the resource person and your keeping Bless him, fill him with your wisdom, so that whatever he shares with us will help us to grow more and more in you. We commit all the participants and your keeping, take care of them, bless them abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Reverend Paras, now you can start your session. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, good evening once again. and. Uh, I want to greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to thank God for this opportunity to continue to study God's word with you all. Uh, before we begin, let's turn in our Bibles to James chapter 3. And if someone is prepared to read from verses 13 to verses 18. May I request somebody to read from verses 13 to verses 18. May I read? Yes, please. James chapter 3 verses 13 to 18. Two kinds of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Okay, thank you. Let me just uh, pull up my screen. I hope you are able to see my screen. And um, we have been looking at the book of James uh, under the theme Real Faith for a Real World. Uh, and as I said in the past few weeks that the book of James particularly focuses on the aspect of Christian faith that is very, very real to our own situations. And so, you know, we always need to go back to James chapter 1, verse 1, where James gives us the context of what he has, I know, what he's going to write. And right in the first verse, he says, uh, you know, that he's writing to the 12 tribes scattered across the nation, people who were going through a time of uncertainty, fear, anxiety, uh, you know, people whose way of life was disrupted because of persecution. And I said, for you and me, that is a common point. That's a common denominator because given the pandemic situation, the, you know, the coronavirus, COVID-19, we have also experienced our lives being disrupted. Um, you know, for some of us, it's been in terms of job. For some of us, it has been mental stress, health issues, and all the rest of it. And so it is in that context uh, of fear, anxiety, uncertainty that James says what he has to say, uh, the power and the relevance of Christian faith. And so uh, up to this point, we have looked at James speak about trials. 
he has spoken about temptation. He has spoken about uh, the fact that we need to treat everyone equally, that we should not be uh, show any kind of favoritism. And then James chapter 2, 14 onwards, he speaks about faith that is more uh, tangible. It's not just a feeling, but it is something that is demonstrated in our day-to-day -day living. And then last week, we had looked at this aspect of the use of our words, the use of our tongue. Uh, James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, where he says, faith reminds me that my words create worlds. My words have the power to either give life or destroy it, to build someone or to wreck someone. Uh, and so the Christian is called to be a builder. He's called to be someone who would bless others uh, through the use of his tongue. And if you remember, I had concluded by saying that at the end of the day, your problem and my problem is not the tongue. It is the heart. Because Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if you want your words to be a blessing for others, you need to fill your heart with Jesus. It is when his love overflows that the mouth will then uh, produce a blessing for others and today i want to look at the next part of james chapter 3 uh, only five verses a small section over there which says uh, which i have entitled as a faith that helps me to discern between earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom there are two kinds of wisdom that james essentially speaks over here and this wisdom that James is essentially speaking or the knowledge and the understanding that he's making a reference to is connected to James chapter 3 verse 1. You remember where he said, not many of you shall presume to be teachers. Uh, the warning that he gives to us at the beginning of the chapter is that teaching, claiming that you have uh, knowledge is dangerous because with more knowledge, there is more responsibility. There is more accountability. And so it is that same thought that James is further continuing. He's saying those who are teachers use their words to bring healing. And now he goes to the second part of it and he says, those of you who call yourself as teachers, or rather he makes it more broad and he says, those of you who call yourself to be knowledgeable, how is that knowledge, wisdom demonstrated in your, in your life? And that's where he actually, uh, you know, deals with that entire theme of wisdom in those five verses. Let me begin with a very interesting quotation that I read some time back. You know, uh, there's this person called Miles Kington. I don't know who it is, but he made this very interesting comment. Uh, you know, the quotation is that knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, tomato technically is not a vegetable. We use it as a vegetable, but technically, when you look at how a fruit is categorized, uh, tomato qualifies to be a fruit in the scientific understanding. And that is knowledge. You should know that. But wisdom is not, is wisdom is to know that when you put a tomato into a fruit salad, you're going to mess it up. So in one sense, what you know the quotation really says that there is a world of a difference between knowing something and applying something and i think the tragedy of our world today is that we are flooded with knowledge you know you talk about the google generation the young people have all the information at their fingertips literally uh on you know because of the internet because of their uh, the accessibility that they have to information and sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that information is equal to wisdom. But that's not true. You know, some of the most brightest minds can yet make very, very foolish mistakes. Some of the most clever people, uh, you know, can make blunders uh, in the way they live their life. Uh, I was reading somewhere uh, in an article that said that when it comes to smoking, it is doctors, uh, you know, who are, uh, you know, who are consuming a lot of this uh, uh, tobacco, who are uh, addicted to smoking. Now, if there is anyone who knows that smoking harms you, it should be the doctors. You know, they have the information, they have the knowledge. But what happens is 
they are not able to put it in wisdom. They are not able to apply it. And so that's where James basically brings us these two understandings of wisdom that is from the world and wisdom that is from God. You know, in our own life, I'm sure you may have uh, come across people who are very, very wise when it comes to the ways of this world. You know, what we call street smartness. There are people whom in our day and age, we call them, oh, they ha he has a business sense. Uh, you know, she's street smart. And sometimes what we are really saying is that that person can manipulate, that person can maybe cut corners, that person can even cheat, lie, uh, you know, do fraud and get away with it. And sometimes when people do that and when they get away with it, the world applauds them and says, you know, oh, he's so wise. He knows how to avoid, uh, you know, the, the, the clutches of the law. He knows all the loopholes to get out of it. And so the world that we live in operates at these two levels. There is a worldly wisdom and then there is a heavenly wisdom. And James is essentially pointing that those of us who claim to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, must demonstrate heavenly wisdom, not earthly wisdom, not the worldly wisdom. I want to, uh, you know, take a kind of a diversion and look at something else before I look at the theme of wisdom, uh, because when it comes to these two choices of heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom, you and I have the choice to pick up one of them. And this is a theme that runs through the Bible, uh, you know, from the Old Testament right to the New Testament. There's a section where Moses says in Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20, this is what he says. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord is your life. Now, when you look at that particular verse, that particular slide, there are three levels that Moses is essentially presenting to us. You know, he begins by saying that you and I have these options of blessings and curses, life and death. How do we get blessings or how do we get curses? He says it is based on our choice. He says now choose life. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. When we make certain choices, it leads to life. When we make certain choices, it leads to death. And where do these choices come from? These choices come from the voice that we choose to listen. And that's where he says, he says, listen to his voice. So essentially what Moses is saying is that every choice is preceded by a voice. And every choice is followed by a consequence. You and I have the freedom to choose. But once we have made the choice, you and I cannot choose the consequence. If you choose to listen to God's voice, Deuteronomy 30 says, you will have blessings, you will have life. If you choose to reject God's voice, you will have curses, you will have death. You and I have the choice to choose what we will listen to, whom we will listen to, but we cannot choose the consequence of that choice. You cannot say, I'm going to reject God, but I want blessings. You cannot say, I am not going to listen to his voice, and yet I want my life to be a life of fullness and abundance. And that's where James essentially comes in. He says, the choice is given to you, whether you will choose the earthly wisdom or the heavenly wisdom. If you choose the earthly wisdom, it will take you in one direction, if you choose the heavenly wisdom, it will take you in another direction. You know, that's what Jesus also said, that there is a narrow gate and a broad gate before you. It is your choice which gate you will choose. But once you choose that gate, you have to bear the consequences of where that road leads you. You choose the narrow road, it will lead you to life. You choose the broad road, it will lead you to destruction. And so James essentially in these five verses is helping us to understand these two choices that we have. If you have the outline that I sent to you, uh, please pull it up and it will, you know, it will be helpful as we go through it. So the first thing that James says is, we have earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom, choose one. And in these five verses, 
he kind of delineates this whole theme of wisdom on the basis of these three categories. He contrasts it in terms of its origin. Where earthly wisdom originates is contrasted where heavenly wisdom originates. You know, he says earthly wisdom has its origin in a certain place. Heavenly wisdom has its original in a different place. I'll come to that in a minute. Secondly, he talks about contrast in operations. Not only is the origin contrasted, but then he says the way it works out, the way it is logically played out in life is also different. How it operates. Heavenly wisdom operates in one sense or in a certain way, whereas earthly wisdom operates in a way that is contrary to the heavenly way. So both these ways operate. Both these ways bring results. But the way they do things is counterintuitive to each other. The ways of the world are not the ways of God. And the way that God uses to accomplish his things is not the way of the world. But both work, both the work, uh, ways work. So there is a way of the world and there is a way of God. And then thirdly, uh, James also speaks about the contrast in outcomes. You know, remember I said that we have a voice, we have a choice, and we have a consequence. Every voice is every choice is preceded by a voice. And once you listen to either God's voice or whether you reject God's voice, there is a logical outcome of it. There is a consequence that follows. The voice you listen to will determine the consequence that you will get. If you listen to God, you have life and you have blessings. If you listen to the world, if you listen to the devil, you have death, you have curses. So every wisdom has an origin, has a way, and it has an outcome. And those are the three things that James basically opens up for us, or rather unpacks for us in these five verses. Small passage, but it is loaded with a lot of things. So when you look at the second thing, uh, the first aspect of what we uh, you know, just spoke about, the contrast in origins, where uh, wisdom originates. As I said, there are these two kinds of wisdom and both have their origin in two different opposing poles. You have the earthly wisdom, you have the heavenly wisdom. How is the earthly wisdom categorized? Earthly wisdom, when you look at verse 15, let me read it for you. Verse 15 says, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. Three things James tells us about earthly wisdom. He says earthly wisdom to begin with is one dimensional. It is earthly. That's the word he uses, earthly, one dimensional. What he's basically pointing out is that the earthly wisdom or the worldly wisdom or the man-made wisdom, as you may call, takes into consideration only the dimension of our, uh, of our life right now. It looks at only life as we understand the tangible part of it. You know, it was uh, Paul who in Corinthians, when he's um, first Corinthians chapter 15, when he's speaking about resurrection, you know, one of the arguments that he puts for resurrection is this. He says, if there is no resurrection, then we may as well as eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we will die. Now, that particular verse is a philosophy that Paul was quoting. He says, if that is all there is to life, that we eat, we drink, we be merry, and then we die, and then that's the end of it, then resurrection doesn't make sense. And our culture, our world, the world that we live in, there are people who subscribe to that philosophy. There are people who live by that philosophy. You know, they say, we don't know what is going to happen after death. We know life is only what I can see right now, what I can feel right now, what I can experience right now. So life is about eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. And if that is the reality, then everything that they do is driven by that wisdom. So it is okay for me to cheat. It is okay for me to think about my happiness, my ambition, my goals. I don't have to care about anyone else. Why? Because when I die, I'm gone. You know, nobody is there to think about me. There is no judgment. So that is one dimensional reality. 
Secondly, James says, not only is it temporal on this earth, but he says earthly wisdom is also sensual. It is unspiritual, doesn't take into regard the spiritual aspect. One of the best examples I can give you in the Bible is the story of Samson. You know, Samson was this, uh, you know, it is often said that Samson was this He-Man. I don't know how many of you have seen this program, He-Man. I remember when I was a child, uh, you know, I grew up watching this He-Man, this, uh, you know, this powerful, uh, strong hero, uh, muscle bound. And so someone has said that Samson was a He-Man with she problems. You know, he was always falling for the wrong woman, getting in trouble uh, because he had no control over his heart. And Samson, Samson lived a very sensuous life. He had no regard for the spiritual. His wisdom, again, was driven by earthly wisdom. And that's where you see how Samson life's life unfolds, because he was, he was given into sensuality. Again, as I said, there are people in our world who live by that philosophy. If it feels right, it must be right. You know, that's what they say. And then thirdly, earthly wisdom is also demonic or is of the devil. That's what James says. It is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. When we say demonic or of the devil, what we are essentially saying is that it is set against everything that stands uh, for God. It stands against God's ways. It stands against God's methods. Again, a very simple example I can give you is Jesus's own temptation. Where if you remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil, you know, three times he came and he offered his wisdom. He said, these are stones turn them into bread. The Bible, the word of God promises that if you jump from here, the angels will come and hold you. You know, he was offering a way out. He said, bow before me and the, world, the kingdoms of this world will be yours. You don't have to go to the cross to be the king. I will offer that to you. It is an earthly wisdom that is giving a shortcut. It is an earthly wisdom that is kind of giving him, uh, you know, saying that if you are hungry, Use your power. If you jump from here, let God uh, save you. And I think in our own life, the devil comes to us with the same suggestions, with the same temptation, that if you have the power, use it for your own end. If you have the ability, make sure that you are promoted. Doesn't matter if others are crushed in that. So earthly wisdom is dim one dimensional. It is sensual. It is demonic. And contrary to this, James presents to us the heavenly wisdom. How is heavenly wisdom um, categorized? Number one, he says heavenly wisdom is relational. James chapter one, verse five, is the first time when the theme of wisdom is actually introduced, where James says this, if any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God. Wisdom comes as a relation, as a result of a relationship with God. You remember that famous verse uh, in the book of Proverbs where the writer of Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you fear Lord, when you fear God, you will get wisdom. So in other terms, wisdom, heavenly wisdom is a result of a relationship. Fearing God simply means the way you relate to him. So when you relate to God, God gives you wisdom. Wisdom is relational. It is not propositional. By propositional, I mean theories, you know, and, and just bookish. In the Bible, wisdom is also defined, is always defined as a result of a relationship that we have with God. Secondly, James tells us that wisdom is not only relational, it is also demonstrational. When you look at James chapter 3, he says this, who is wise? and understanding among you. Let him show it by a good life. Let him show it. You claim to be wise, demonstrate it. Wisdom, again, is not a feeling. Wisdom, again, is not a status. Wisdom, again, is not a position. Wisdom, at the end of the day, is a reality that has to be seen. You know, Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter um, 11, verse 19, he said, wisdom is known by her actions. Wisdom is known by her actions. Anyone who claims to be wise must demonstrate it. 
Wisdom is relational, wisdom is demonstrational. And thirdly, James tells us that wisdom is progressional. Wisdom grows. Look at James chapter 3, verse 9, uh, 18. He says, the peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Raise a harvest of righteousness. A harvest is something that grows. You plant a seed, you water it, you take care of it, and out of that, it germinates into maybe a small shrub, into a small plant, then it grows into a full tree, and then it produces fruit. There is growth. Heavenly wisdom is something that grows. The more you love the Lord, the more you walk with him, the greater you grow in your ability in making wise decisions. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in an instinct, but it is something that takes time and it takes as you learn to surrender more and more of you. So wisdom that comes from earth is temporal, is limited. Wisdom that comes from heaven, first and foremost, comes as a result of our relationship with God. The second thing uh, that James speaks about, he says not only of the origin, but also of its operation, of how it operates. Again, you have two categories. You have the earthly wisdom, and you have the heavenly wisdom. Earthly wisdom, he categorizes in four terms. He says, earthly wisdom is categorized as bitter envy, self-ambition, boasting, and deceit. When you look at verse uh, 14, you know, this is what he says. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. You know, you need to notice something over here that when James speaks about wisdom, it is fascinating that he connects the aspect of wisdom to relationship. You know, look at these things, envy, ambition, boasting, deceit, and then the heavenly wisdom that we are going to look at. All of these have to do with relationship, with our relationship. So at the end of the day, if someone were to say that I am wise, how would you know? I think the litmus test of a wise person is to see how he handles his relationships. If his relationships are flawed, which simply means he doesn't have the wisdom. Wisdom is not a matter of how well your business is running. Wisdom is not a matter of how big your house is or how big your bank balances are. Wisdom at the end of the day is how well you are able to manage your relationships. You know, that's where James essentially pinpoints it. Wisdom is all about our interpersonal relationship with others. And he says the worldly wisdom, the earthly wisdom is governed by self. Look at those four words, envy, ambition, boasting, deceit. What is envy? Envy is the dissatisfaction of not having something that someone else has. You know, you envy something that someone else has and you wish that I had. What is ambition? Ambition is the dissatisfaction of what I have. You see, envy has to do with what I don't have. Self-ambition has to do with what I have, but I'm not satisfied. I want something more. You know, as in English, they say the grass is always greener on the other side. I don't know whether I've quoted this statement, but there is someone who said this very beautifully. They said, as a rule, man is a fool. When it's hot, he wants it cool. When it's cool, he wants it hot always wanting what is not. And I think that's so true, that as human beings, as fallen sinful human beings, we are always wanting more than what we have. And when we don't get that, there is a sense of envy and a sense of ambition, selfish ambition. You know, it's not just self-ambition, it is selfish ambition, which motivates our life. Envy is not having what others have, Ambition is being dissatisfied with what we have. Boasting is taking pride in what we do have. It's kind of flaunting it. It's kind of throwing it in other people's face and saying, hey, look, I have a big car. I have a big balance, a big house. And deceit is in one sense covering all of that up and saying that I, I don't have this. I don't have that. I want this. I want that. Until I don't get that, I will never be happy. Deceit has to do with a sense of hypocrisy. Deceit has to do with a sense of 
untruthfulness. And when you look at it, all of those things have to do with our relationship with one another. This becomes clear when you look at the other side. James says heavenly wisdom is defined in these six or seven categories. Number one, he says heavenly wisdom is pure. Look at verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. He says wisdom that comes from God, the first hallmark, the first category or the first mark of godly wisdom is wisdom that is pure. Wisdom that is true. You know what James is essentially saying is that when you are a wise person, you will not compromise. The mark of a wise person is someone who does not compromise. You know, unfortunately, we live in a world where we have this 50-50 attitude. You know, in Hindi, we say, Sab chalta hai. And so we sometimes say, you know, we live in the world. I have to, you know, I can't be a holy joke. I can't live like a monk over here. I have to weigh, I have to live the way the world lives, which means sometimes I have to cheat. Sometimes I have to lie. Sometimes I have to compromise on my morals. God in his word is reminding us that heavenly wisdom doesn't compromise on the truth. Heavenly wisdom is pure. And when you think of interpersonal relationships, I think that is a hallmark, isn't it? Any relationship that is not based on truth will never thrive. Any relationship where deceit is the foundation is bound to fail. And so if relationships is the foundation or, or is the bedrock of wisdom, then purity definitely becomes the pillar on which it stands. Because the moment you take away purity, the moment you take away truth, you know, that relation will only fall, it will crumble. So James reminds us and he says, heavenly wisdom is pure. Secondly, he says heavenly wisdom is not only pure, but it is also peace loving. You see, sometimes in our truth, and I think this, this we were talking about it at the end of the previous uh, session, you know, when we spoke about judging people and when we spoke about, you know, that sometimes we can be so harsh at those who sometimes are not able to rise to the standards that we feel uh, are right. But here's what James is saying. He's saying that those of us who are under the, you know, the influence of godly wisdom, heavenly wisdom, for us, truth is important. But at the same time, we are also those who are peace loving. So we don't throw our holiness, our purity in other people's face. We don't go and pick up fights and say, you know, you're not living a right life. You know, you are doing this wrong. You are doing that wrong. Peace loving category when it comes under wisdom is someone who is able to speak the truth in love. You know, that's what Ephesians chapter four tells us. Speak the truth in love. It's interesting when you go back and read that particular verse, uh, you know, in Ephesians where it says speaking the truth in love. There is in the original Greek language, there is no speaking. The word speak is not there. What it really implies the, the literal translation of that verse over there is truthing in love, truthing in love, which means it's not just your speaking. It is living. It is relating. It is demonstrating. It is everything that you do has to be in love. And I think people who are governed by heavenly wisdom are those who don't go around picking up fights just because they think they are pure or just because they think that the others are not living the life uh, that uh, is right or upright. Heavenly wisdom is, uh, is, is peace loving. Thirdly, heavenly wisdom is also considerate. Heavenly wisdom is also considerate. To be considerate means, when you look at the Greek word, the word considerate that is used over there, has the idea of someone who's willing to learn. You know, someone who doesn't claim to know it all. Someone who is not a me know it all kind of attitude. So wisdom has an openness of learning. You know, I'm, I'm in the profession of teaching. I'm, I'm a teacher by profession. And one of the things I have learned over these years as I've interacted with students is this, that, you know, in life or when students come to us, they come basically for three things. They come to learn, they come to unlearn, and they come to relearn. 
you know, learn, unlearn and relearn. And as a teacher, I have found it easier to for students to learn. You know, they, 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 they can learn new things very easily. But the difficult part is to unlearn. If they have learned something that is not right, it is very difficult for them to unlearn it. And that unlearning block obstacle actually does not let them relearn things. So education in one sense is more of unlearning than learning. And only when you unlearn can you truly relearn. And so what James is saying is that when we are considerate, we have an open disposition that we are not fixed in our mind and saying, no, this is the way things have to be. But we are willing to accommodate the other person. OK, but remember, this is without compromising your purity. You don't compromise your standards in order to accommodate someone. Fourthly, James goes on to say that heavenly wisdom is also submissive. Heavenly wisdom is something that is willing to recognize that I can learn from someone else. It is the ability to recognize that I need to submit to someone so that I am in a position to learn. Sometimes in our own life, when we think ourselves to be wise, you know, we think it places us at a superior level. And we then start judging other people. We start looking down on others. But the Bible actually gives us a very counter perspective to that. Let me give you one example. When you turn to the book of Romans, chapter 15. And let me read a verse from there, Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 3. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 3. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good, uh, for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the insults of those who insult you will fall on them. Okay. Verse one is very clear. It says, for we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. If you consider yourself to be wise, one of the hallmarks of your wisdom is how much you are able to submit to the other person. You know, this comes in our relationship in marriage. This comes in our relationship in terms of children relating to parents. You know, if you think that you are wise in a relationship, the question that you need to ask yourself is how willing am I to submit to the other person? Or do I insist that it has to always be either my way or highway? You know, that's what we do in relationships, isn't it? My way or highway. You either do things the way I want to do it or it will not be done at all. But heavenly wisdom, godly wisdom keeps us humble enough so that in a relationship we are able to submit to one another. In fact, that's where Ephesians speaks so much about it. Husband and wives submit to one another. Children obey your parents. Submission is a part of godly wisdom. Jesus, when he was growing up, the Bible tells us he grew in wisdom, in stature and in knowledge. And this happened as a result of him submitting to his parents. So when we submit to the authorities that God has placed us around us, we demonstrate heavenly wisdom. Fifthly, we are full of mercy. Again, wisdom has the ability to care for one another. You know, it was Abraham Lincoln who once made this statement. He said, he has a right to criticize who has a heart to help. He has a right to criticize who has a heart to help. If you have wisdom, if you have knowledge, if you feel that you know better than someone else, then when the other person makes a mistake, when you respond with mercy, you are demonstrating wisdom. When you respond with harshness, when you respond with a critical spirit, you know, no matter what your knowledge, your level of knowledge is, no matter what your claim of wisdom is, it all falls short. Because at the end of the day, mercy is in recognizing that all of us need a second chance. You know, when you look at the Bible, the Bible is basically a story of second chances. You go back to Abraham. You know, we say Abraham is the father of our faith. Was he a perfect man? Absolutely not. 
you know, you look at his life story and Abraham made mistakes after mistakes. You think of David, man after God's own heart. Was he perfect? Absolutely not. David made mistakes after mistakes, and yet God showed him mercy. You come to the New Testament. The disciples before the resurrection did not understand Jesus' mission. Peter denied Jesus three times, and yet Jesus restored him and demonstrated mercy. What is wisdom? Wisdom is to look at people, see the faults, but also recognize the potential that they have. You know, one of the things as leaders is to recognize the potential among those who work with us. And sometimes those who are in our care will make mistakes. You don't discard them, but you show them mercy because you are encouraging the God-given potential that is in them. So heavenly wisdom is pure, it's honest, it's true, it's self-loving, uh, sorry, it's peace-loving, it's considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and then it has good fruit. Wisdom is demonstrated by fruit. You know, that's what uh, James goes on to tell us. In verse 15, he says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit. You know, Jesus said, a tree is known by its fruit. Your wisdom will be seen in the way people relate to you. What you actually put out in the world. You know, it's not, not just your intention. It's not just your feelings. But at the end of the day, your words, your behavior, your attitude, how you respond to life situation, all of that is what constitutes your fruit. Jesus said, a good tree will bring out good fruits. A bad tree will bring out bad fruits. In fact, we have looked at this in, even in the previous section. You know, when James speaks about tongue, he says each tree will bring fruit of its own kind. If you and I claim to be those who are driven by heavenly wisdom, then we must demonstrate the fruit. We can't just make a claim. We have to substantiate it with evidence. And what is the fruit that the Bible speaks about? Paul uses the same category in another epistle. He uses it in Galatians, where he says the fruit of the spirit is love, peace, joy, kindness, uh, faithfulness and all the rest of it. You know, when you look at all of those categories, they're very tangible. You know, love, patience is, is a tangible aspect. Are you patient with your children? Are you patient with your spouse? Are you patient with those who work under you? Are you patient with people who make mistakes? That is where the fruit of your spirit, the fruit of being governed by God's wisdom is essentially demonstrated. Pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, fruit, uh, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, impartial. Heavenly wisdom does not look at people on the outer appearance. We've already looked at this when James spoke about uh, favoritism. We don't look at people on the basis on their, of their external values, external qualities. We look at people on the basis of who they can be irrespective of their background, irrespective of, you know, where they come, what baggage they carry, what limitation they have. When we relate to people in a way that is true, then we demonstrate heavenly wisdom. We demonstrate wisdom that is pure, wisdom that is free from bias. And finally, when uh, James speaks about heavenly wisdom, he speaks about wisdom that is sincere. The Greek word that is used over there is word that is uh, used to describe hypocrisy. And what James is saying is heavenly wisdom is free of hypocrisy. There's no mask. We are genuine. You know, we are real before the world. We are real before God's people. And one of the qualities that you will see in the scripture is that God's people have always been those who stood clear before God, but also before God's people not just before God. You know, sometimes we say, oh, God knows my heart. I don't care what the world thinks. Now that may be true, but at the same time, we must also be careful of our testimony. You know, Paul in, in Corinthians says this, he says, if my eating meat is a stumbling block to a weaker brother, I will stop eating meat. 
So it's, he says, it doesn't matter to God whether I eat or I don't eat. But if that action becomes a stumbling block for someone else, I will not engage in that. Hypocrisy or sincerity is when you stand clean both before God and before God's people, where your faith in God is strong, but so is your testimony before a watching world. When you are living under the influence of heavenly wisdom, you live your life with that kind of integrity. You live your life with that kind of consciousness so that you know that not only is God looking at your heart, but the world is looking at your behavior. You want your heart to be clean before God, but you also want your behavior to be above reproach before a watching world. You remember the story of Daniel? You know, the book of Daniel tells us in chapter six that Daniel's colleagues tried to find something that was wrong in his life. And they came to the conclusion that he was above reproach, that when it came to his work, there was nothing that they could pin on him. And so they said, if we cannot pin anything on his professional work, we will have to do with his religious life. You know, what a testimony. What a testimony for the, our colleagues to look at our life and say, he is above reproach when it comes to his work. The way he deals in office, the way he does his work, he's above reproach. Heavenly wisdom has that kind of sincerity. It is pure. It is peace loving. It is considerate. It is submissive. It is full of mercy. It has a good fruit before the watching world. It is impartial and it is sincere in everything that it says and it does. Wisdom is contrasted in its origin. There are two sources of wisdom, world and God. It is contrasted in its operation, the logical outworking. And thirdly, James also contrasts it in terms of its outcome. In verses 16, he says, uh, the earthly wisdom produces disorder and evil practices, whereas heavenly wisdom produces a harvest of righteousness. You know, in our own homes, in our own churches, in our own society, why do we find so much of discord? Why do we find so much of disharmony? Maybe it is because we are depending more on earthly wisdom. Maybe we are running our churches by earthly wisdom. Maybe we are living our family life more on earthly wisdom. Maybe the way we relate to one another in our own groups is driven by earthly wisdom. And therefore, the result of that is that we have discord in our families, in our churches, and in our societies. James says, if you want a harvest of righteousness, learn to put heavenly wisdom in practice. Learn to put God's pure wisdom in practice. Because when you do that, he says, the word that he uses over there, he says, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. You know, what you sow and when it is harvested, the harvest will always be more than what you have sown. You know, that's the beauty of it. You sow one seed, the harvest is going to be, uh, you know, 10 times of that. When we live driven by heavenly wisdom, when we live under the influence of the Holy Spirit, what we invest in, our relationships, the returns that we get will be 10 times. 10 times of peace-loving communities, 10 times of mercy, you know, 10 times of sincerity, 10 times of purity and uh, you know, the good fruit that the Bible speaks about. So where you invest, is what you will get as a return. You invest in earthly wisdom, you will reap the harvest of discord and evil practices. You invest in heavenly wisdom, you will uh, get the reward of righteousness, a harvest of righteousness. So wisdom is differentiated in its origin, wisdom is differentiated in its operation, and wisdom is differentiated in its outcome. The choice is for you and me where and by which wisdom we live our life. Let me close with one final quotation by John Maxwell, a well-known uh, leadership author, Christian author. Uh, you know, he says this, he says, life is a matter of choices and every choice you make makes you. I like that statement. Every choice you make makes you. When you choose to be a pure person, it makes you a pure individual. When you choose to be a sincere person, it makes you a sincere 
you know, a person who's sincere in everything that he does. The choices you make in turn influence you. When you choose to submit to God, it demonstrates the wisdom that will shape your life, your relationship, and the outcome uh, in this world. And so choose your investment very carefully. Where will you invest? Why will you invest? And what is the ultimate goal of your investment? If you want to reap peace, joy, and happiness, then the word of God is very clear that we need to invest in the kingdom of God. If you invest in the way of the world, you will get the reward as discord and evil practices. May God give us the grace to make wise choices to invest in his kingdom for his glory. Shall we look to God in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the reminder that has come to us that we have two choices before us, to choose the wisdom that is so often considered foolish in the eyes of the world, wisdom that comes from above, wisdom that is heavenly, wisdom that is godly. Father, we pray that you would give us the discernment in difficult situations to depend not on the earthly wisdom, but to depend on worldly, to depend on heavenly wisdom. We want to thank you, Father, for you have said in your word that do not rely on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge the Lord and he will make your path straight. And so, Father, it is our prayer this evening that as your people, you would continue to fill us and refill us with wisdom that will shape our lives, that will help us to depend more and more on you, so that at the end of the day, the fruit that we produce in our lives before a watching world would be one that affirms our faith in you, that testifies and demonstrates our faith in a living God. And so, Lord, to that end, we commit each and every one of us into your hand. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, for the past 15 minutes, you heard uh, from the book of James. I hope uh, you understood everything very clearly. Now it is the time for you to uh, react. If you have any doubts or anything, now you can ask. No, it, it, it is very helpful and I'm very inspired by hearing the wisdom and thought on wisdom from God better than the wisdom in the world. Thank you so much. Reverend, I have a question. Uh, uh, just want to ask you, like you said that uh, um, about uh, like if if we have to correct someone who's not in Christ, uh, many times I face uh, this problem. Uh, the person, even though if you if you say in love, they always take you in a different direction or a different uh, way, or they misunderstand or I don't know. So how to deal in these situations? Like if you have to correct someone and someone who's you know that doing wrong. Okay. Uh, I think there are, there, are, there are basically two things, uh, you know, that we need to do when we speak about, um, you know, when we speak into someone's life. And I think before you speak into someone else's life, you need to actually earn the right to speak into someone's life. You know, you must earn the respect of that person. Let me give you an example to simplify it. When you look at, Psalms 23, you know, it says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want him, gives you that all of those things. And then there is this particular verse, you know, where it says, when I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, when you look at a shepherd's uh, instruments, he had these two things, he had a rod and a staff, okay? And a rod was basically to keep away the wild animals. A staff, was essentially to keep the sheep in line. So there are two images over there. One is the image of love and the image of protection. When we want to protect someone from a wrong decision, you know, sometimes we are very quick to use the rod and say, don't do this, don't do that. And sometimes we are not so, uh, 
vocal or open to show the staff, to show our love. I have been a pastor for five years and my own experience has been this, that when people know that you love them, they give you the right to speak into their life. Okay, this doesn't happen overnight. I mean, even as parents, you know, we know that, you know, dealing with children is sometimes it's a lifelong struggle, but you continue to do that. You know, you continue to tell them that we love you and therefore we want the best for you. So, I mean, you know, it would really depend on the situation, but my general answer to you would be that continue to love this person, whether he or she listens or not, love that person. And once he or she is uh, convinced, convicted that you have the best in mind for him or her, they will open up for you to speak into their life. And I think sometimes with our own Christian settings, that's a dimension that we miss. You know, we are very quick to discipline. We are not so quick to show our love, our care and our concern. But when we couple both of those things, the rod and the staff, the protection and the, uh, you know, the love, both of those things, when we bring it together, I think people are more open to listening to us. Uh, I, I hope that kind of gives you some direction, even if it's not a direct answer. Thank you. Any other questions? No, that's good. I always love his teaching because he's a perfect teacher. He teaches. <laughs> So well, so nobody can ask any questions. That's good. Okay, uh, just I want to give you one more uh, second. If any of you have any question, you can ask. Otherwise, we'll wind up. Nobody is having. Okay, shall we all join together in the Lord's prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen now may the grace of our lord jesus christ our father and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all now and forevermore amen thank you all for you, joining uh, this okay. uh, bible thank study you. thank you all god bless you good night thank good you night. Paris. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Paris. Okay, bye bye.